Okay, so we learned about Buckingham Pi Theorem last lecture, how awesome it is. We also learned how to find the pi groups if we needed to um, for, these, uh, for these types of problems um, to use in the Buckingham Pi Theorem. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do today to practice this stuff is we're going to practice similarity um, because actually the concept of similarity is I think much more important than um, the actual finding of the pi groups. It's kind of rare that you'll find the pi groups. Most people have done that already for a lot of different problems that are commonly encountered. Um, but knowing how to enforce similarity and what that means um, will, will allow you to use those pi groups that other people have already found. Um, a classic example of this is uh, centrifugal pumps, right? Uh, centrifugal pumps are easily analyzed using dimensional analysis, uh, but unless you really kind of understand the similarity that's going on behind the scenes, um, it's easy to kind of screw it up and, and not not apply it completely correctly. All right, so um, remember that we are we have some hypothetical situation where we have a function of some physical variables. Uh, we don't know what that function is, and there, by the way, for the record, there's two different ways of writing this. Sometimes your book will write it as um, the thing that you care about. In this case, we're going to go back to our old friend, the, the, the ball in a uniform flow of uh, fluid, um, and we want to be able to calculate the drag force. Um, so sometimes the thing that you want to be able to calculate, uh, people will write it as FD is equal to some unknown function of all of the physical variables. Um, sometimes they include that in this function here. You can do it either way because um, this function is function one, let's say, is just equal to function two minus FD, right? Like you can, when, if you have an unknown function, it's really easy to uh, manipulate it so that you can um, change how it looks when you write write it, write it down because it's unknown, right? Um, great. So uh, we've done this problem already uh, to death. Well, not to death, but we've done it. So we know pi 1. Pi 1 is equal to f over rho v squared d squared. And just as a reminder, our v is the velocity of our fluid. Um, rho is the density of our, our fluid. d is the diameter of our ball. And fd is the drag force on our ball. And our pi 2, we know, is equal to our rho v d over mu. Um, and this remember is our all-important Reynolds number Reynolds number this is our drag coefficient which we will again when we get to chapter s can't remember if it's seven or nine it's odd and after six um, but in that in that chapter we will uh, uh, look at the drag coefficient and, um, and and apply it a whole bunch of in a whole bunch of places um, it's very similar to the lift coefficient for the record so, um, yeah, we have our two pi groups, right? And so if I were to ask you now, what does Buckingham Pi Theorem tell us about the relationship between these two pi groups? You would write down that pi 1, which is equal to f over rho v squared d squared, is equal to some unknown function of r pi 2, which is rho v d over mu. You could also write it as equal to some unknown function of the Reynolds number. Great. So um, sometimes we're giving a nice plot of this function, and sometimes we're not. If, let's assume for the moment we're not given a plot of this function, although you could easily look it up 20 different plots on, on Google in about 20 seconds. Um, Let's assume we don't have those plots. So let's assume that, that we have this unknown function of the Reynolds number that's equal to our pi 1. And we want to do an experiment <coughs> Excuse me, where um, we're going to use this experiment to predict the drag force on a prototype. So our prototype has a diameter of 10 centimeters. The velocity of our prototype is 100 meters per second. So it's very fast. It's um, actually at the bare edge of what we might consider uh, incompressible flow, right? Because remember, um, compressible flow is applicable for uh, velocity is equal to about 0.3 c, where c is the speed of sound, which is about 330 meters per second or so. So we're slightly under that that limit, so we're we're okay. 
but it's it's still at the bare edge at which we can expect our drag force to only depend on our Reynolds number. If, if we were a, much above 100 meters per second, we might have to add in our Mach number into this um, into this function here. We might have another uh, another dimensionless parameter. And the way that would show up, by the way, is we would add another physical variable, and that physical variable would be the speed of sound. Okay, anyway, back on track. So uh, we're going 100 meters per second. We have a density of one kilogram per meter cubed of, of our fluid and a viscosity of one times 10 to the negative fifth kilograms per meters second, meter second. And this viscosity here is, uh, and, and density correspond to right about air. Air is actually a little bit more dense and a little bit more viscous, but we're rounding it into nice easy numbers here. Great, so that's our prototype, and it's very difficult to get a wind tunnel that'll reach uh, 100 meters per second, right? We do, however, have a wind tunnel that will reach 10 meters per second, which is the limit of our equipment, um, and it's an air wind tunnel, so our, our fluid will be one, will be, uh, will be air, so it'll have a density of one kilogram per meter cubed and a viscosity of one times 10 negative fifth kilograms per meter second. And the question we have is if we want to do an experiment which allows us to measure the drag force because of a nice wind tunnel on our ball in the wind tunnel, what would we have to, to set the parameters of this experiment so that eventually we could compare that drag force to the drag force on our prototype? Well, that, that act of setting your parameters so that you can eventually compare the two experimental results is called similarity, enforcing similarity. And enforcing similarity means that we take um, for that function where we have pi 1 is equal to the function of pi 2 through pi p. Setting all pi 2 model equal to pi 2 prototype and then all the way to pi p model to pi p p. Uh, I got lost. I got lost. Yeah setting those two equal allows us to enforce similarity because a function is a function, right? A function is a function precisely because if you put the same numbers into it, you're going to get the same number out. It's like if we said y is equal to x squared plus x. Yeah, that's good enough. Well, let's put a 3 here. Who cares? Um, if I were to plug a 0, oh, well, let's make it actually multiple, multiple variables just to make it interesting, plus um, z. So if I plug a 0, 1 into this, right, a 0 for x and a 1 for z, I'm going to get y is equal to 1. No matter how many different times I plug in 0 for x is equal to 0 and z is equal to 1. No matter how many times I do that, I will always get y, y equals 1 back. And so as long as we're plugging the same numbers into this unknown function, we are going to get the same pi 1 back. Okay? So that's our goal. So uh, if we want to enforce similarity, that means we have to set, for our particular case, we only have a pi 2. And we only have one extra pi group. So pi 2 model has to equal pi 2 prototype, um, which means that rho, oh, sorry, rho v d, that's model for all of these over mu model, is equal to rho v d over mu prototype. Now, luckily, uh, we have a shortcut here. We know that rho of our prototype and rho of our model, um, so rho of our, uh, the, the thing that we're going to predict and the rho of the, the experiment we're going to do are the same. So we're going to cancel those out. Our mu's are the same too because we're using the same fluid. Now if we were using a different fluid, we'd have to plug in those pr uh, values and we wouldn't be able to cancel it out. Great. So we know that the velocity of our model is equal to 10 meters per second. So we have 10 meters per second. We don't know the diameter of our model. That's what we're solving for. Great. And that's going to be equal to the velocity of our prototype, which is 100 meters per second, times the diameter of our prototype, which is 10 centimeters. Yeah, 10 centimeters, which is 0 0.1 meters. Great. So we know everything here except for 10 uh, the diameter of our model. So if we solve for that, we get a diameter is equal to one meter. Great. So what this tells us is that if we set up a wind tunnel that has a velocity of 10 meters per second with a ball in it that has a one meter diameter um, in air, then we and we measure the drag force here, measure FD model, 
then we know that we can compare, not the drag force, but we can compare the drag force divided by rho v squared d squared of the model to the drag force divided by rho v squared d squared of the prototype. And that's all because we enforced similarity by forcing the Reynolds number to be the same. Now note, if we had been doing this in compressible flow where we were um, a much, much above 100 meters per second for the prototype, we'd have to add uh, the Mach number in here, which means we'd have to uh, match the Mach number as well, which becomes very difficult because then we would have to match the velocity. And, and uh, yeah, so it's very much more complicated. So the more pi groups you have, the harder it is to enforce similarity for the record. All right, so now we got to compare pi groups. All right, so if we perform this experiment, let's say we do this experiment in the wind tunnel, um, and we measure on our one meter ball a force of 10 newtons. Okay, so what does that mean for our our prototype, our, our the, the thing we're trying to predict? Well, the thing we're trying to predict, um, because we've enforced similarity, we know that pi one of our model has to equal, sorry, pi one, has to equal pi one of our prototype. So we know that F, over rho v squared d squared of our model, model in here, has to equal f prototype of our rho prototype v squared prototype d squared prototype. So pi 1 of our model has to equal pi 1 of our prototype, like again, because we matched our Reynolds number. And the whole thing that's telling us that this works, right, is Buckingham Pi Theorem. Uh, yeah, so let's um, let's see the things that we know. Do we know the density, velocity, diameter, and force of our model? We do. Do we know the force of our prototype? Nope, that's the thing we're trying to figure out. We do know the density, velocity, and diameter of our prototype, though, because those are the, we're setting those. We're engineers. that We get to set things. That's our whole job description is... Yeah, you could literally put that on your resume, for the record. I, 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 I done set things to make things work. That's actually a really good line. Anyway, okay, so, uh, right, let's plug stuff in and, and find out what our, our force on our, our, our prototype is going to be. So we have 10 newtons, oops, that's not a very good end, apologize, um, divided by, uh, again, because our densities are, are the same, we can cross those out, but we do need to, to, to divide by 10 meters per second, got to square it, got to divide by 1 meter squared, and that's going to be equal to our unknown force drag force of our prototype um, divided by 100 meters per second squared times its diameter 0 0.1 meters squared and um, it turns out crazily enough that the drag on our prototype will be equal to 10 newtons complete coincidence for the record um, it doesn't have to be the same it just turns out it's the same here because of the way the, the math worked out but but we know that the drag on our prototype for our 10 centimeter diameter sphere traveling at 100 meters per second is going to be 10 newtons if our experiment on our one meter ball at 10 meters per second measured 10 newtons great all right, we're going to skip over our quiz, not quiz. And we are going to do quite possibly the greatest uh, example problem of all time. So we want to know if we can estimate the energy of a nuclear bomb from just a photo. So if you look up photos online of nuclear bombs, explosions for just after the time that they exploded, you can find some where you see this beautiful sphere. Sometimes it's partially cut off by the ground and you can actually see some of the reflections of the explosion coming off the ground and anyway um, and and they give you they were kind enough to give a, a, a length a length bar um, usually on the photo uh, that says you know this is a hundred meters right um, and they also gave you a delta T after the explosion so remember this is in 19 early 1950s mid 1950s uh, um, this is after World War II, um, and we were trying to basically, uh, I don't know how you, well, we're trying to intimidate the whole rest of the world and say, listen, we've got this amazing nuclear bomb thing. Not only do we have an amazing nuclear bomb, we have 
the capability of exploding it and taking a picture a thousandth of a second after it explodes. What now, right? But we refuse to tell people how, how much energy these bombs released, right? Um, and the reason we did that is we want people to be scared. If you tell people how much energy a bomb released, they could potentially calculate how much damage that bomb will do. And then, um, and then basically be like, well, I'm, I'm cool with losing a third of the city, you know, if that means we win the war. But if you don't know how much, how much of a city you're going to lose, that's much more hard. It's much more difficult to make those calculations. So the U S government and the military made the decision that, um, you know, the whole point of nuclear bombs is to intimidate people. Let's put out this data to intimidate them, but not tell them the key point of how much energy these bombs were, were, um, were, were releasing. Um, so they start, like I said, they started doing this. They did this a lot in the 1950s, but they started in 1948 or, or mid, mid 1940s doing this. And um, there was this comp just this incredible fluid. Uh, he was a he's a physicist, really. But he, he, he made incredible contributions to fluid mechanics. Um, there's this famous story about him. His name is G.I. Taylor. Uh, there's somebody who knew him or worked in the same university with him. And they said one day they walked by his lab and he was in there and he had a, uh, uh, a large beaker on a record player. And the, the beaker was turning slowly and he was cutting pieces of matches into the water and watching them spin around in the water. Um, and he's like, and they're like, what, what, what the heck are you doing? And he's like, ah, I'm working on a new paper. And apparently a month later, he published this groundbreaking paper on uh, um, rotational, rotational flow or something like that. He, 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 he just had an incredible mind, right? An incredible understanding of fluids. And he knew dimensional analysis. And so he decided to uh, stick it to the U.S. government. He's British, by the way. So, um, so yeah, he decided to use dimensional analysis and say, hey, I think we can figure out how much energy this bomb is releasing from these photos. So what he did is exactly what, well, his analysis was a little bit more complicated, but it turns out you can do it a little bit more simply than what he did. Um, we can leave out some steps. He wrote a paper about it. We're not going to write a paper. So let's do the, the, the simpler version here. Um, we're going to write out all the variables that, that ma uh, the physical variables with their units. Okay. So we have, uh, the first thing is the amount of energy that's in this bomb. That, how much energy is the bomb releasing? Two, we're going to use uh, the radius of the explosion. That's the data we have. We're going to use the time past the explosion. We're going to use the density of air, density of the air outside. And we're going to use the atmospheric pressure. Now you're asking, how do we know that these are the variables that matter in an atomic bomb explosion? And it turns out, People have been doing dimensional analysis on explosions for quite some time at this point. Um, well, not quite some time. Um, pretty much since I think the start of World War II is when they really started doing it. But uh, it, the, all the governments of the world sent, spent an incredible amount of money on science at that point. So science made a, a lot of advancements. So did engineering. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they knew that these were the things that mattered for an explosion. And he said, well, an, a, an atomic explosion is bigger, but it's still an explosion. So let's see if this works. So he took the energy and he said, all right, energy is mass length squared, length squared per time squared. The radius is just a length. The time is obviously time. Our density is a mass per length cubed. And our pressure is just a mass per length time squared. Good. So now we determine the number of pi groups that we have. Well, we have five n is equal to five. So um, if we want to determine the number of pi groups, then we get n is equal to five, k is equal to three, and uh, p minus sorry, p is equal to n minus k. So uh, five is equal to five minus three is equal to two. So we have two pi groups. Great. Now we're going to pick our uh, next step is to pick our repeating parameters. Which is um, we're going to pick as repeating parameters our energy, our time, and our density. Now again, 
We have rules for picking repeating parameters. Those rules say that um, they have to be, uh, we have to pick three of them because we have three primary dimensions. We have to pick unique, um, they have to be unique. We can't pick time over and twice, which is fine. We don't actually have any repeating variables here. Sometimes, especially with uh, like measuring the drag on objects, with a wing you might have several lengths that you use, or with a plane you might have several lengths that you use. Uh, so you don't want to pick length twice. Um, and we don't have any powers of other uh, units. We can't pick a length in an area, but that's not a problem because we don't even have an area in here. So we are repeating parameters are valid repeating parameters. Um, now we solve for the exponents. Solve for our exponents. So, pi 1 is going to be equal to, let's do r first. That's our, let's remember, we're, we're building our pi groups around the um, physical variables that were not part, uh, that were not picked as our repeating parameters. So, we're going to build our first one around our radius. We're going to multiply that by our energy to the a power times our time to the b power and times our density to the c power, which ends up being equal to L times mass length squared over time squared to the A times the B and mass per length cubed to the C. Um, oh, I forgot to mention this, I think. Maybe I said it. But uh, remember, it takes experience to pick these repeating parameters. And um, like I said, G.I. Taylor was building upon the experience of people who've been doing explosion research in the past. So they kind of knew that these, these repeating parameters were important or useful. They, they produced pi groups that were useful. Okay, so let's solve for our exponents. I'm gonna pause it and allow you to do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, hopefully you paused it. You did it, now you're coming back. So let's do mass is equal to zero is equal to zero plus a plus zero b plus c right because we have zero mass we have zero here we have a mass on top so m to the one a plus zero to the b plus m to the one c so zero one zero one our length we have zero is equal to always equal to zero because we're trying to cancel out all of our 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 units is equal to we have one length here, so it'll be 1 plus L to the 2A. Uh, uh, sorry, oh man, I was thinking ahead a step and then I wrote down exactly what I said. 2A plus 0B plus L to the negative 3C. So negative 3C. And T is equal to 0 is equal to, um, we have 0T here, so we have 0 plus um, negative 2 t to the negative 2a, um, t to the b, plus 0. Great. So um, if you solve for these, what you end up getting is you end up getting that you have pi 1 is equal to r times um, rho to the 1 fifth over e to the one-fifth times uh, t to the two-fifths. Yeah. Um, cool. So uh, we can actually rewrite this as r times rho over e t squared to the one-fifth. Great, so that's our pi 1. Let's go to our pi 2. Um, now I'm going to let you write out this initial part. So I want you to pause it, write out this initial part here for pi 2, and then solve for the exponents in the same way. All right, so we're going to write down that P, our pressure times, remember we're using pressure because it's one of the non-repeating variables that we have. So pressure times um, e to the a, t to the b, rho to the c is equal to m over l t squared, that's our units on our pressure, times m 
L squared over T squared times A, TB, M over L cubed times C. And I'll let you guys, or hopefully you've already filled out your um, set of equations for um, your exponents, but if not, pause it and do it now. Remember, we're trying to do engaged learning. You're not just writing down what I'm writing down because you won't learn much at all. And you'll have to spend a lot of time cramming for the exam. Okay, so hopefully you took the time I was talking about um, engaged learning to do that stuff. We have 0 is equal to um, 1m. We have an m on top plus m to the 1a plus m to the 0b plus m to the 1c. So note that this is exactly the same as up here because remember these this part of our equations repeats. So I'm just going to write this down since I know it's right. But remember that on an exam, doing it twice is not the worst thing because if you get a different answer the second time, you know you made a mistake. Um, and this is really one of those situations where um, you just have to turn the crank on this, right? There's not a lot of decisions to make. You just it, We're going to tell you what repeating parameters to use. And you if, you're, if we make you solve for pi groups, and then you just have to turn the crank. So the only reason you'd lose points is if you made mistakes, if, as long as you understand the process. Um, so don't make mistakes. Do it twice and then check to make sure you got the same thing as before. But we're just going to write this down because uh, this is a lecture. So um, we got negative 1 because we have an L on the bottom plus uh, 2A plus 0B minus 3C. T, and we have 0 is equal to uh, negative 2 plus um negative 2a plus b plus 0 great so now if we solve for this one we get uh a lot of weird fractions again right we get that we have uh pi 2 is equal to p times and then now we have to write out our our system so we have t to the 6 fifths oops over e to the two fifths times rho to the three fifths. Yeah, at this point, if you were able to solve this system of equations for these uh, fractions, you're doing really quite good. So now we're going to, uh, this is obviously is equal to pressure times um, t to the sixth over e squared times rho cubed, all of that to the one fifth. So now we have our two pi groups. Pressure time, our external pressure times this, our radius of our blast times this quantity. And now our step two is uh, enforce similarity. All right, so now we have to, we have to remember enforcing similarity comes from Buckingham Pi Theorem, and Buckingham Pi Theorem tells us that Pi 1 is equal to some unknown function of Pi 2 through Pi P. And enforcing similarity is all about matching Pi 2 through Pi P for our experiment and our prototype. Now our prototype in this case is a giant nuclear explosion. explosion. Our, our model, did I say prototype? Yeah, our prototype, oh I said, our, uh, our prototype is a giant nuclear explosion our model is a reasonable explosion in your backyard or well a research lab so uh, in that case um, we need to match only pi 2 because that's all we have remember our pi 2 is equal to pressure times this these quantities um, you'll note by the way that the energy the thing we're solving for is not not it, it occurs in both of our pi groups right uh, normally that would be a problem because you have an unknown then in your pi group so it's difficult to match pi 2 to pi pi 2 model to pi 2 prototype however it turns out that um, <laughs> is it close to our favorite number that's clever we're going to use trivial pursuit rules on this right um, if I had to have you guess what pi 2 is equal to you're going to guess 0 1 or infinity and since one seems like a, well, one is a, 
potential answer. But if we looked at pi 2, um, our time is in general small, right? So we have a very small number on top. Our energy is gigantic, so we have a very small number, or very large number on bottom. So in general, we have small to the sixth, the sixth power over large to the, to the second power. Actually, not even large. Let's, let's step it up a notch. Huge squared. Um, this is going to be equal, this is approximately equal to zero, right? And it turns out that's true for most explosions. So most explosions, as long as you're early in time, our energy is large, our time is small, pi 2 is pretty close to zero. And we know from experiments that um, when g of, that g of approximately zero is equal to one. So, um, enforcing similarity is easy. We just have to make sure that we do an experiment where we have our pi group quite small, which is not hard with explosions. In general, you're going to take an ex a, a picture early and you're going to have a decent amount of energy. So when we know from this experiment that when g, when our pi 2 is approximately equal to 0, our function is equal to 1, which tells us that our pi 1 of our prototype is going to be approximately equal to 1. So now if we set our um, pi 1 equal to 1, we see that that's equal to r times, I'm going to write this down up here, p to the 1 fifth, uh, p rho over e t squared, and rho over e t squared to the 1 fifth. And if we plug in our, um, the radius that we know, which is 200 meters, times our density, which is 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed, um, divided by our energy, which we don't know, and our time, which was uh, 1.5 times to the negative third seconds, square that, take it all to the one fifth. We, in solve for E, we find out that E is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the 14th joules, um, which is equal to 250 mega 250 not megatons kiloton of TNT um, so an incredible amount of energy really if you think about it um, 1 times 10 to the 14th joules that's either uh, that's like that's like a thousand toasters running for more time than you'll be alive <laughs> Uh, well, no, maybe that's not true. There's a thousand toasters running for a very long time because a toaster is about a kilojoule or kilowatt. So a thousand uh, toasters would be running at one times ten to the six watts. A, to uh, a thousand toasters equals one times ten to the six watts. So if we have, we want to figure out how much time this is going to be. We take two point five times ten to the fourteenth joules divided by 1 times 10 to the 6 watts that gives us uh, 1 times 10 to the 8 seconds and um, if I bring up a calculator real quick we find out that um, 1 One times two. That's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Divide that by three six zero oh, oh, gives us uh, twenty seven thousand hours. Divided by twenty four gives us a thousand days, which is a little over a thousand days, which is a little less than three years. So for three years, a thousand toasters running constantly, and that's how much energy this bomb released. Now the question is, was he right? Was he right in terms of how much energy? And it turns out he was. Well, in terms, of a, in terms of nuclear bombs, he was almost spot on. See, the original bombs were somewhere between one kiloton of uh, TNT to 500 kilotons. And since this was relatively early in the whole um, thing, it was before they started getting larger, it's likely that it was right around 250 kilotons of TNT. 
So he did quite well. And after this, the U.S. government was like, what? What? Okay, fine. And then they started releasing the actual amount of energy. Um, so, yeah. Uh, lesson of this... Uh, well, there's multiple lessons from this, uh, this lecture. One is don't mess with good fluid mechanics. Uh, <laughs> fluid mechanicians? I don't know how to say it. The second is that um, it's quite possible to do... Uh, to, uh, to model behavior that would be very difficult to um, to computationally model or theoretically model um, but we can make it experimentally accessible through dimensional analysis and the way we do that is we um, oh, I went too far we think carefully about what variables physical variables are important we um, solve for our pi groups or they're already given to us we enforce similarity um, through Buckingham Pi theorem Pi theorem and then we uh, once we've enforced similarity then we use pi 1 equal to pi 1 in order to solve for the the parameter that we that we'd have a difficult time finding any other way um, and we do this all the time for all kinds of things. Now, it turns out there are uh, situations where this is not possible. For example, um, large ocean-going ships um, are, are bound by the Frode number and the Reynolds number. And it turns out you can't, for large ships, you can't match the Reynolds number and the Freud number um, in water, right? So you have to use some exotic liquid, but it's not really possible. So you can't do these kind of experiments for some situations, but for the situations where you can, where you, where you can match all of the pi 2 through pi p, um, it's an incredibly powerful way to, uh, to predict the behavior of systems.